networking uh, and collaboration, and probably more importantly now with COVID, productivity. So um, hello to everyone. Thank you, Andrew. And I know, again, you're going to be here for quite a few of our webinars, aren't you? So we can call yes. on your expertise and your specialisms. So that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. And enjoy Croatia. I'm very, very, very jealous. <laughs> Especially with the weather here today. It's really, really horrible, grey and nasty. So we're very lucky. Very, very lucky indeed. Thank you. We'll chat to you later. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. So before we um, kind of get started, I also just wanted to mention that Ofcom have done a really good study recently um, and they have found out that us as adults are now spending over a quarter of our day online. Um, now that doesn't sound very much, but if you think about half of your day you're asleep, um, I would say a quarter, probably more for some of us to be quite honest. I, I, I reckon I chalk up about three quarters of my day online. Um, and also they've shown that there's been a 74% increase in spend for digital activity, which is absolutely huge. Um, so we've got absolutely every reason to want to adopt our digital technology. So I think without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome our first speaker. And as we said before, if you want to pop anything in the q and I'll try and take questions as we go along. Is that okay with everyone? Um, so Nat, I'd like to welcome Nat Tula for Freedom Works. Uh, Nat's been with Freedom Works since its inception in 2016. Um, she comes from a brilliant background of working with high growth startups and she's here today to tell us all about how digital technology has helped Freedom Works scale up and actually it was Nat that wrote the application for this whole program so praise to Nat. Um, but over to you Nat. Hey everyone, lovely to be here and lovely to meet everyone and, and see so many faces in here and I hope you've all enjoyed the experience of, of Remo because it's certainly new for me but it's great to be able to hop around the tables and see everyone. Bear with me just one second because I'm going to bring some slides up so let me see. and could I, I don't know if someone could give me a thumbs up or, or just let me hear their voice to know whether you can see the slides or not that I've got in front of me. Yeah, yeah that's up. all good now. Yeah, brilliant. Beautiful. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm really pleased and honoured to be here, actually, because I'm a, a massive fan and advocate for digital adoption. Um, and it's part of what I do at, at Freedom Works. And my role at Freedom Works is looking at our systems and our processes to see how we can effectively grow and scale. So just a quick introduction. Well, firstly, to myself, um, that's my role at, at Freedom Works. And I've been working kind of on the corporate side and then also for for, for startups, just seeing how digital has transformed businesses, going from you know offices with printers to now paperless offices and everything being done online. Um, and also just kind of the beauty of digital technology and how it does let you automate um, and become more streamlined and, and cost effective. So a little bit about us at Freedom Works. Um, as Cheryl mentioned, we are responsible for um, part leading the series so that there's two um, series within these I think there's 28 webinars in total and, and freedom works that are running two of the series which is this one which we're kicking off today which is all about getting online as a business and then also the series three which is systems and, and productivity so the tools and the tips that you can use to, to really become I think more automated and, and productive which is key as a business. Um, so Freedom Works, we're a, a co-working and a flexible office space. Um, we've got seven co-working spaces now dotted across the southeast. Um, we started in 2016 as one office space in Worthing um, with our founder, John Trigg, running that. So over the past five years, um, we've grown pretty quickly. Um, so again, digital adoption has been really key to, for us to be able to scale. Um, we've got 2,500 members in our network um, across those seven spaces. Um, and let me tell you a little bit more to try and bring it to life for you. So part of those seven spaces is we've got um, a space in Chichester, Gatwick. We've got um, a space in Hove, which is a creative hub, um, where we've got the basement, which is dedicated to production facilities um, and a media suite, which is perfect for the creatives um, or the big cluster of creatives in, in Brighton and Hove. We've got a space in Southampton. Um, we've got a second space, so we've got two spaces in Worthing now, and then a couple more coming online this year in Lansing and also in Hastings. And I hope you can see from the pictures kind of how we present ourselves. So we are co-working. Um, so we work with 
entrepreneurs um, and freelancers, but we also create a home from home for bigger businesses. So, you know, you might be a three man band or um, a 10 man band. Um, we create a home for all of uh, all of our members um, and create a real kind of membership um, and co-working vibe. Um, so we've got beer, free beer Fridays, um, we do a lot of lunches, and then we also provide a lot of business support. And this is kind of where we've dovetailed with West Sussex County Council to help bring these brilliant series of, of free webinars. And I know as well on, on the call, we've got Richard Butcher. So Richard is our in-house coach. So anyone that joins as a member, um, we'll talk to Richard and, and, and Richard will um, help understand the business needs and then signpost you to all the wonderful free services that we've got at Freedom Works. So that's a little bit about us. So to go on and talk a bit more about Freedom Works and I guess our success story post the pandemic in terms of digital adoption, um, lockdown has been really hard for us as a business, as I know it has been for everyone on this call personally and also from a, a business perspective. Basically, we saw sales and memberships drop off a, a cliff edge as, as the first lockdown hit. Um, and for us, being able to adopt digital technology has been really key to being able to weather the storm. Um, and now we're kind of coming out of the end of it, we can almost see that the silver lining of actually how the pandemic has made us accelerate some of the digital processes that we've adopted. So in terms of us as a, as a business, um, as a co-working space, we weren't forced to close. It wasn't mandatory for us to close as a business. So we still kept our doors open. But as we all know, the messaging from government was don't go into the office unless it was absolutely essential. So you can imagine almost kind of overnight, we just saw offices go from being packed and busy and buzzing to only one or two people coming in. Um, we also struggled with a lot of our members being afraid to come back for a long time. Um, we also had to navigate as a, as a space the social distancing restrictions that by law we had to put in place. Um, and then we also had to juggle staff self-isolating as well, which all in all created a really big impact on what is actually still quite a small startup team um, that we are. So we had to kind of quickly think about what can we do to lessen the blow of this um, and the blow being that um, revenue was down um, and we also had a lot of team members off um, we had to furlough a lot of the team um, so we started to think about how can we still keep the, the business running in the most cost effective way um, but making sure that we still retain the customers that we do have and once things eased how can we quickly open the doors and, and, and bounce back from this so there was two things that really, I guess you could say saved our bacon. Um, one of the things that we did at Freedom Works was we did a complete overhaul of our website. So we did have a website and we did have an online presence, but it was nothing more than a brochure, um, to be fair, where you could go and you could have a look and you could see what products and services um, we sold, but there was no functionality behind it. You couldn't buy or do anything on the website. Um, so what was really key for us was to be able to move everything online so that members could book products and services online and so that we could take out that human interaction side of things, which I know is lovely and we still have our community managers on site, um, but our business was no longer reliant on customers having to come in to book products and services um, and us to have a member of staff sat at a desk to be able to book those products and services um, and handle the payments. So we end, we put all of, our, all of our products and services up online. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the impact that had um, on the sales and the businesses shortly. And we also had to have a think about what products and services could we make that were virtual and that were online? Because obviously there wasn't the same appetite from customers to come into the co-working space when we were in the thick of the pandemic. Um, so we also started to put some virtual products online. So we've got our virtual office packages, which is where you can have a virtual address and you can have your virtual post, um, not your virtual post, your post looked after by us um, and a virtual kind of reception desk. And those products really took off. So we saw them go from, I think it was so minimal re revenue we had for them was sort of £250 a month before. And that kind of overnight went to 3K a month, which was great for us. So that was a bit more revenue that was coming in um, and helping cover the costs. And then we also made sure that all of our products that we did have were super, super flexible. So the one thing that we really immediately saw was that no one wanted to commit to anything long term because the future was so unpredictable. 
and still is to, to a certain extent. You know, we don't know what's going to happen this winter. So all of our products, which were very flexible to start off with, so people would could book for a month or, or have a month's membership. Now we've offered services where you can hot desk and just book a hot desk for a couple of hours or just book a meeting room for a couple of hours. So it's kind of taken away that barrier or that blocker of, of people having to commit in, in uncertain times. Um, and what we've seen is, is we've seen the sales for those really flexible products has, has tripled, which has been fantastic. And we've also seen traffic on our website go from, I think it was a thousand views on the homepage per month to 3000 views um, a month now on the homepage. And also what people are doing on our, our, our website has really increased. So people are hanging around longer, they're looking at things. And obviously people are able to book and pay for, for things in the comfort of their own house, um, at a time that suits them, you know, I know what it's like, Some I've got a three year old, sometimes I'm up at 11 o'clock at night catching up on things and doing things. So it's just made doing business with us a lot easier um, and it's helped us bounce back as well. So these are all things that have been accelerated. I think because of the pandemic, it's really made us step on the front foot and, and do these things sooner rather than later. And then the other piece of tech that we also enabled as a result of the pandemic is, let me just click forward. It's the wrong button. Um, was a system called Doorflow Technology. So, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, as a business, we had to be really careful with social restrictions and social distancing and, and making sure that we manage the space really safely and that we make our members feel safe as well. Um, and there was also a restriction on head counts and, and how many people we can have in the building in certain spaces. So, we implemented a technology called Doorflow Technology. Historically, we had a fairly kind of dumb access control system with a key fob. Doorflow technology now allows us to link members and the products that they've bought to their access to our spaces. So if you're a dedicated member and you've got um, full access, then you can come in when you want. If you've maybe booked a meeting room just for two hours, then you get a shorter window of access to, to one of our spaces. But it allows us to track exactly who's in the space um, so we can keep an eye on, on numbers um, and make sure we stay safe. And we also didn't realize at the time, but it also enabled us to then sell another product, which is 24 seven access, which was, yeah, this was consequential, um, I think, but we can now allow people to come into the space 24 seven, which we've realized that there has been a real uptake for because people like to come in late at night and especially when everyone's socially um, kind of distancing, it, it just allows people to stay away or come in when, when the office is less busy. So those two things have, I think, really transformed our business. And I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a success story in the way that, you know, um, the lockdown has, has forced us to, to, to find some success stories. And then finally, I'm going to end now, but I just want to share this with you. So both of those projects that we did to help with our digital transformation, um, which made us more productive and able to increase sales, we've had grants to do both of those, both of those things. So I want to let everyone on this call know that there are grants out there to support you. And there's one brilliant one that is open and out there at the moment. It's called the Business Hot House Grant, um, and it's run by Business Hot House, which is part of Chichester University, um, and it's managed through Invest4, which falls under Brighton and Hove Council, that's all too much information. All you need to do is go on the website. But basically, um, you can have a, a very small grant, so up to 5K, or you can go for a bigger grant of you know, several thousands of pounds. And they're really itching to give this money away to um, businesses. And it's for any business that can demonstrate a, a project that they want to work on that is going to enable and help them grow, grow their sales and grow their pro productivity. Um, and what they do is, you have to fund the project up front, um, but then they will subsidize and give you the cash back. So they'll subsidize 40% of your costs. So this is a great one to know about. Um, I know some people are put off by grant funding because they think it's reams and reams and pages of applications. If you're applying for a grant that's under 5K, which were both of the grants that we got for those two projects that I mentioned, um, both of those are, are kind of just a couple of pages of details that you need to fill in. It's, 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 um, yeah, it's not too onerous. And there's wonderful support from the Business Hot House as well. They run regular webinars on, on how to do the application process. And on that note, I'm just going to say thank you very much. I hope everyone really enjoys this session today. I'm hearing from the other speakers and also please do sign up for the rest of the series because there's some really great um, sessions in there. Thank you everyone.
Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nat. Before you run away, before you run away, um, just one, one short question um, from the audience. Um, Andrew's asked, are centralised office-based businesses moving more to having multiple local hubs? So are businesses actually condensing and then having different office space at different places along the coast or throughout the region or, yeah. or throughout, you know? It's, it's a, it, yeah, it's a really good shout actually. And, and thanks for asking that question. We've been really lucky because we have seen exactly that happen. So all of the big corporates based in London or kind of in the major cities, they've been empty and they've got these big properties and assets that sit on their balance sheets, which are big costs. And they're, they're trying to get rid of it because no one's coming to the office anymore. Um, work is never going to go back to how it was. It's always going to be a hybrid working model. So they're mm -hmm their offices and what they're doing is they're now setting up what's called hub and spoke models so they're setting up smaller offices in kind of regional areas particularly around the kind of the commuter belts so that um, staff don't have to go into the London office for example but they could work from Crawley or they could work from Brighton and we're seeing a lot of interest from those organizations to come and you know find a home with Freedom Works yeah so it's it's absolutely true. I think the world of work and how we've worked is, is never going to go back the way that it was. But at the same time, people don't want to spend the rest of their lives working from their kitchen or, or from their bedroom like we all have either. We, we need somewhere that's a bit more conducive and, and where we can keep our social skills of talking to other people going. <laughs> I was going to say, on that note, Freedom Works still have their free beer Friday, don't they? So if you are in a Freedom Works office on a Friday, John does open the fridge and um, it is a quite a nice social time. And I think that's going to just grow and grow now. Everybody's back. So no, it's brilliant. Thank you so much, Nat. Really appreciate that. And obviously, Nat's going to stay with us during networking so we can bombard her with questions about Freedom Works and the programme and the grant funding. Um, yeah. Because not only, I mean, it sounds like a real sales pitch, doesn't it? I feel like one of those selling channels, but not only can we give you the support, we can also help you find some money. So, um, you know, chat with us about that as well. But thanks ever so much, Nat. Thank you. Thanks. Brilliant. Okay. Well, um, let's move on. Um, let's move on to Bradley, who's going to actually come and talk to us about Network My Club and how they fared during the pandemic. Obviously, um, Bradley, you were networking through big venues the Oval and the Amex, and then suddenly everything was shut down overnight. Um, that must yeah. be quite scary. So, yeah, thanks. Yeah, tell us about Th that. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I have just relocated, as, um, as, as always, when you're just about to do something like this, power drills from builders next door, go ahead. So um, I've, I've just relocated, so hopefully I'm coming through, um, coming through uh, smoothly. But I'm going to share my screen just to tell a little bit about the Network My Club story, because as... Um, as Cheryl alluded to there, uh, as a business network, my club, in a nutshell, we are a business networking organization. Um, we're a membership organization based across the Southeast uh, and London. And up until, I'll take you back to uh, up to the start of March 2020, uh, last year, um, our business was, was going smoothly, uh, built on bringing people together face to face uh, at iconic sporting venues. And overnight, our business model became redundant. Um, we couldn't bring people together face to face. The stadiums were closed. Um, and so we had to find a, an alternative solution. We had to find a digital solution and ways to adopt digital, which is the, the topic of today's um, first, first series. And um, for us, we, we as a membership organization, we had an obligation to try and keep our members connected. Um, and, uh, and, and, and I'm just going to sort of talk you through that journey because 18 months on, we have changed a hell of a lot of business. I think my personal view is, is that like a lot of other industries, particularly networking though, is what I can speak about is it's been fast forwarded about 10, 15 years, uh, the way that things are doing with, with the adoption of, of online networking and great to see so many of you here adopting that. And I'm sure you've spent many, a many an hour on Zoom calls and Zoom networking events and that sort of thing. But let me take you back to March 2020. Um, this is what Network My Club would look like back then, um, in-person events using Iconic as a place to do it. Um, and venues like the Amex Stadium in Brighton, 
Twickenham Stadium, the Oval Cricket Ground, both in London and the Aegeus Bowl um, Cricket Ground in Southampton, as well as the likes of the Medeski Stadium in Reading, Portsmouth Football Club. Um, our, our business was built on bringing people together like this at stadiums like that. So as you can imagine, when the pandemic hit, we were, we were left with no other choice but to go online. Our first um, decision was to do what everyone else did, and we got a Zoom account. And uh, this is a, a site that I'm sure a lot of you have become familiar with over the last 18 months. Might even be a few bones in the audience there, having, having become so sight of these um, walls of faces, as, as I like to call it. But we did what everyone else did, and we got a Zoom account um, just to keep our members connected. And for us, this was... This was working okay, probably for about a week or two before we as a team realized that this was not scalable. It was not going to be, um, it was not going, for, for our business, it was not fit for purpose because as a network that spread across the Southeast and London, not so much a localized network. Um, you know, we were trying to connect our members um, across all these different parts of, of, of the Southeast and trying to manage it in a way that we weren't doing events with lots of people. We kept them quite intimate. Um, and as a result, as a, as a team, we were, we were delivering so many of these events and we were getting Zoom fatigue before it was even a, um, before it was even a common phrase and what, what's become uh, quite a well-known phrase. But um, we as a team just realized that probably after about two or three weeks, there must be a better solution. Uh, and for us as a business, Thankfully, we had the mindset um, that the pandemic might not be something that was just going to last a couple of months. Uh, we thought this could be a, a little bit longer. So we started to explore other platforms. We landed on Remo. Um, this is actually a screenshot from our first uh, Remo event back in April uh, 2020. Uh, looks a little bit differently to, to what it does now, uh, but this is what it, what, it, um, what it looked like. And for us, Remo saved our business. Um, I, I recently did a talk with Remo, uh, gave them a case study as well as, a, as part of an interview. And I said to them, they won't get a better testimonial from anyone um, than, than me by, by simply saying Remo saved our business. And what it allowed us to do was put together online events in a much more visually pleasing way, um, manufacturing a room to make it more suitable for networking, the way that the platform works, allowing people to move around different tables and have conversations with just those people on a table. It just humanized the online experience. And for us, this was a real game changer for us. I also just want to share, this is a picture of me taking a selfie of that, that actual event. And I think I posted this on LinkedIn saying, um, a, a new experience for us on Remo. Can't wait to see everyone in person in a couple of months time. And that was, uh, yeah, how wrong I was back then because uh, 18 months down the line, we then, we've, we've only just got back to investor. But what we, did, we, we, we persevered with Remo and we really embraced it. And this was the result for us. This is of work on the Remo. We then designed and built our own Network My Club branded networking lounge. This became a place where our members started to connect and meet on a weekly basis uh, at our online events. And it became a place that they became familiar with. And we designed this room with networking in mind. We had specific areas like private one-to-one -one tables where members could have those private one-to-one -one conversations during a main event and then just jump straight back into the main action. We had timeout seats where people could just take a couple of minutes out if they needed to uh, with anything. The doorbell might have gone, the, the kids might have been banging on the door or the dog, you know, timeout seats to be able to just move to another part of the room. Desks and a reception desk where they where members could come and see us and, and get help if they need on the platform or just come and uh, any, if anyone was visiting the event, they could come and meet some of the team. So for us, this really became a, a platform that saved the business and it became a place that our members started to realize that networking online can be as close to the real thing as 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 uh, as possible using using this platform and that's that was really the key thing for us is that we've been able to deliver events on remo 
pretty much to the same format that we were delivering them in, per- in person, you know, with that open networking time, guest speakers, um, Q and A's or, and, and just that, that freedom for people to go back into a room um, and, uh, and freely and move around the room. And you add on to that, the, the time that people are saving, not traveling to in-person events, the opportunities they're unearthing, particularly for us and our membership. We had members in Brighton and Sussex that were meeting members in London and the surrounding areas, and then members in Southampton and Hampshire that were meeting people in all those different areas. So for us, you know, the online has really connected our membership um, a lot more than if we were to to have just carried on doing in-person events where there was a little bit of a little bit of that crossover in terms of regions but the online just just fast forwarded it. It would be wrong of me not to talk about our digital adoption without talking about some of the events that we ran for other organizations. So much like we are helping deliver the events in this and this series for FreedomWorks, around all last year, I was approached by a number of organizations when lockdowns were getting pushed back and restrictions kept getting pushed back there were a lot of event organizers that had to keep pushing back their events and they saw the work that we were doing on Remo and they came to me and the team and they said, we love what you're doing on Remo. I've got this event concept. Can you bring it to life for us on Remo? And we started to get all sorts of things like the County Business Club's virtual awards, which was a virtual business awards night for for businesses across Sussex. And we delivered an awards night with with their own layout in an awards night themed uh, in, in an awards night theme floor plan with sponsors, sponsors, private areas, even you might see in the top right and top left hand corner there, even bars that people could sit at. Obviously, it was bring your own drink, but visually people could see um, these, these different layouts and visually it was a, just a lot more pleasing. We also did a, a number of events with actually Freedom Works were involved in some of the work we did with, um, with the Manor Royal Business District in, uh, in, in Crawley. Um, other events that we did, we did a national awards night for the Best Business Women Awards. Again, a new layout, a new floor plan that people can, can really enjoy. Uh, even in this one, we had a table of two in the shape of a piano, you'll see there, which, again, was just a bit of fun um, with private sponsor areas, all these sort of things. Other events, well, actually, this, <laughs> this was something that we launched in November last year. We opened our own pub, um, our own virtual pub called appropriately named Network My Pub. And um, we, what we did with this was back in the November lockdown, I think that was lockdown number two, I forget how many we've had now, but back in lockdown number two, we decided that we wanted to open our own virtual pub and open it every day at 4 p.m. for people to come in and just socialize with one another. It wasn't working. We had one simple rule at our pub and that was to leave your sales pitch at the door And it was just a fantastic place that people came into. Believe it or not, we started to get regulars at Network My Pub and uh, people that were straight at first in the door every uh, every Friday at 4 p.m. And and we ran that for a couple of months. And and that really helped people, uh, particularly those in isolation, maybe living on their own or working on their own. It was just a social environment. Then we started to run, like you're looking at here, virtual pub. For, um, in this case, it was for a, a Brighton-based business. They run an annual pub quiz for a, for a charity that they support every year. They obviously couldn't do it. So we ran it for them in our own pub. And I think we raised over £1,500 for them during the night. We had an auction. We had raffles. We had all sorts going on uh, during, the, during the night. So we had a lot of fun in, in our own pub. We also did a, um, this was another event we did in the pub for Rocking Horse Children's Charity. This was a live cook-along with celebrity chef Stephen Edwards. Um, again, another experience that people could come into, meet other people in, in the pub, and then witness a live cook-along. And tr- again, trying to align that in-person event feel. Because of our association with sport, we also delivered a number of sporting-themed events. So this was working with Leicester Tigers Rugby Club. Here is me doing a Q&A with Barry Hearn. Um, some of you, if you're into the sport, might, may know who Barry Hearn is. Um, so we started to, to deliver events for sporting organizations and starting to get back to that association with sport. You know, I'm passionate about, our team's passionate about, and, uh, and really trying to build that connection. 
we delivered a global fans forum for Southampton Football Club, having over 200 of their fans in all parts of the world coming together in their own Southampton Football Club branded lounge. And we did a Q&A with their first team manager and some players. And again, another event that was potentially being postponed that we were able to deliver and make a lot more accessible for people around the world. We worked with people like the Rugby Players Association and also the Laureus World Sports Academy. And these are just a number of different examples of events that we've run. And it would be wrong of me not to talk about this side of our business because this is something that I believe will continue in the long run because businesses and event organizers have realized how much money that they are saving uh, and more, adding more convenience to their attendees while still being, being for that, that experience. But they will be coupling that with that in-person experience as a as sort of a blended schedule, and that's really what we are going back to. So September this this uh, this year, so just last week, we relaunched the business. I like to say um, in a way that is incorporating that in-person event networking experience as well as that online experience. So for us, we've seen that real shift. People have realized the benefits of online. They've realized, you know, the convenience of online. But we also appreciate that people still want that in-person experience. So for us, what we are doing moving forward is we are having a blended event schedule where one week we will have maybe an, one in-person event at one of the locations. But on another day that week, we'll have an online event and we will have a, a, a blended schedule just like that, sort of on a week by week basis, combining um, combining that, that, that online and in-person experience. So that's, that's really been uh, the Network My Club story over the last, Jesus, um, 18 months. I, I lose track now. Um, but that's, that's what you can uh, expect from, from Network My Club. We've learned a hell of a lot uh, over the last when it comes to digital adoption. It's changed our business. Uh, it's in our business. And for me, I wouldn't have said this maybe 12 months ago when I was probably at our lowest point. Um, but it's made us a much more robust business. It's made us more accessible. It's made us more inclusive. And as a business, we are now to relaunch this month. Uh, it feels like a relaunch of the sort of take it on. So thank you very much. Um, do, do check us out. Um, do, um, do give us a follow on LinkedIn. We're always sort of trying to help people as best as we can on, on platforms like LinkedIn by sharing some really useful tips and tricks when it comes to networking in person and online. So that is Network My Club. And uh, hopefully uh, that's, that's proven, uh, giving you some insight into what our last, uh, yeah, our last 18 months has been like. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much, Bradley. I don't think any of us would have quite believed if, you know, back 18 months ago, if you just said you're going to be networking online, you're going to go, be going to the pub online. I don't think anybody would have quite believed each other. No. To be quite honest. Been a, that's probably been the, uh, the, the, the most common phrase I've used this year, this year, eighteen months is you'd, I never thought I'd be doing this. And no. uh, here we are. But as I said at the start, I think we've really fast forwarded a lot of a lot of industries, a lot of ways of working and particularly networking. I think it's about 10, 15 years uh, being advanced. So, mm. yeah. No, absolutely brilliant and a lovely story. And I'm I'm kind of keen to see where all this goes with the hybrid, um, you know, online, offline. I think everybody's keen to get out and meet in person, aren't they? But then, you know, there'll be, as you say, you can connect with people all over the world online. So it's a great yeah. technology to have. So thank you so much. Brilliant. No thank problem. you. Thanks, guys. Um, and then moving on, last but not least, um, I'd like to introduce you to Steve Kusak, who um, his title fascinates me. He's Joint Chief Food Lover of Piglet's Pantry. So I absolutely think that's a brilliant title, Steve. Actually, I'd like a title like that. Um, I think that's I, when you run your own company, you can make the title off as you go along. Absolutely. I think mine would be Chief Pot Washer. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but Steve, um, Piglet's Pantry have had an incredible journey, haven't they, throughout the pandemic and before that. So, you know, over to you. Please, please tell us all about that. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just get this up. There we go. 
So, uh, yeah, basically the title came about because we don't like titles. And uh, so as it was our company, we decided we could call ourselves what we wanted to. So I say joint chief food lover because it was my partner, um, Joe, who started the company um, 10 years ago. So we're just coming up to our 10th anniversary. So it's really basically how we've adapted and adopted uh, and in some cases improved what we've done over uh, lockdown and uh, how we're coming out the other side. So first thing is a little bit of uh, history. So 10 years, uh, there's a, uh, a picture of my uh, lovely good uh, partner, wife, whatever you want to call, um, uh, Joanna Hunter. Uh, basically, she started the company 10 years ago when she went along to buy the boys some season tickets uh, from Brighton Hove Albion. Um, she was chatting along to uh, one of the directors who said that they were going to put in a, I won't mention the name, but a well-recognized national pie company that you can get at petrol stations. And Joe jokingly said, well, that's it. I'm not going to buy the tickets for the boys. Then. So the director turned around and said, well, okay, do you think, if you think you can do better? And Joe said, well, uh, yes, I can. My father used to be a, a pie maker, so I'll come along with some samples. So long story short is she came along and I think she basically fed the directors for about six months um, while they were deciding which products and they were going to use. And the fans pretty much said, whatever you uh, put in the stadium to eat and drink, we will basically eat you dry, drink you dry. And so it was selected that Piglet's Pantry would be the pie provider and um, Harvey's were going to be the beer provider. So Joe then went in. Um, we started producing at the stadium. The chefs got very quickly uh, fed up us and basically said every time they owned a the fridge or a cupboard or they were finding stuff to do with pies, so it was a bit like, ah, you need to find a site. So we moved to our first site, um, basically a 900 square foot site and uh, started producing the pie. So we grew. Um, a couple of years later, we were then, uh, so we started at so 300,000, 400,000, 600,000 uh, pounds. And then um, we got up to, in our latest uh, unit, just pre-COVID, we were doing on track to do just, um, just over 2 million. Obviously, uh, it all kicked in with the COVID, so we ended up doing about 1.7 million. And that's at uh, 70 plus uh, stadiums. We've got a good mixture of predominantly sport, um, including, as I put in there, football, rugby, cricket. But we also do things like uh, the NEC, the O2, various different um, uh, organizations and venues that uh, predominantly have a male customer background. Um, we were a wholesale distributor, so we didn't do anything online. We had no e-commerce business. Um, we had no consumer business at all, really. We had a basic website. Um, we were pies, but we did do a mixture of both savoury and sweet. But yeah, again, most people knew us for our, um, our savoury. So we just started looking at the vegan ranges, how we could extend, how we can do more ideas. So we had a good mixture. But of course, so <laughs> Friday the 13th of March, uh, uh, a date not to forget, we were having worked at Cheltenham. Uh, we were there for the Gold Cup and um, <laughs> we were due to have the game on Saturday with um, Brighton versus uh, Arsenal. Um, Arteta, the manager, got COVID. They called the game. We were then stuck with literally 10,000 pies, which is basically what we have. Um, we get at Brighton on a game-by-game -game basis and uh, literally... So we didn't know what was going to happen, but we knew Brighton stopped. And then literally day by day over the next three or four days, um, we started to lose all our events. Um, a bit like Bradley was saying, literally, your business is all these stadiums. They're all having fans. Suddenly, no fans, no product, no business. So we literally went from you know, 250, 300,000 a month to literally zero. So we had a meeting. Um, we put something out on social media saying, help. We got various different people that came in through uh, social media, through the radio. We had Sky down there and we ended up with a um, literally a queue around the block outside our industrial unit for people coming to buy our pies. So we quickly thought, well, obviously, we can't survive like this ongoing. What are we going to do? So we had a portable till, which we pinched from one of our stadiums. And then um, it was a bit like, OK, we need to get on with this. And we also need to approach Coastal Capital help. So 
we had to pivot the business, which is a lovely phrase everybody's using now. And so we went from being a wholesale to then look into suddenly how we could then go to online. So six of us got together and we just brainstormed all the ideas we could do. What could we do? What could we sell? How could we sell it? How could we get it out to everybody? So as we'd made so many of the various different items within, um, as it were, an afternoon tea, we thought, right, okay, it's coming out to Easter. We needed something quickly for Easter. So we came together with the idea of doing um, an Easter range. Um, so it was the, the, the sausage rolls we'd made. We'd made a big version. Um, we made some quiches. We made some Scotch eggs. We put them all together and thought, right, what are we going to put them in? So we found some cheesecake boxes. So pretty much they're like smaller versions of, uh, of pizza boxes. So that's great. So we can put them all in the boxes and we can put them inside a pack. But OK, how do we protect them? So we need gel packs, et cetera, et cetera. So the whole thing there is, is how can we then get that out to the general public? How do we market it? How do we automate it? All the you know, this is all new to us, but all with this, we had to be done with inside a week so we could get launched very quickly. We um, set up and launched our website. Um, it was like, right, okay, what are we going to do? We need tech to support us. So, yeah, again, we had a website, but there was no shop on it. Um, so we quickly needed to uh, build a shop, uh, shop. Sorry, We spoke to our WooCommerce um, people in order to build the, um, the back end to the shop. We need to set up a payment system. We'd been using pay. They said they were going to take two weeks. We said we don't have that time. So we got Stripe. They did it within that afternoon. And then we looked at how we could repackage everything that we've been basically doing for the wholesale market, how we could then do that for the online market. As I said, we then did the Easter hamper. We put that out. Originally, we had, I think it was literally, in, I mean, as we said there, 3,000 Facebook, but that was broken down to predominantly uh, Instagram. Uh, sorry, a Twitter big bomb. Joe used to talk to the, uh, the Brian fans on Twitter. We had about 150 people on Instagram because we're old. We don't know how to use that properly. And I think about 800 people on Facebook. So it was literally how are we going to get this done? So we had to look at getting online, getting the products out, and then looking at how we can get the uh, production focused. So we've got a warehouse management system, which we wanted to get. Uh, together and then we applied for the uh, coast capital grants which we were successful in getting so it was that very quick shift to online people sat at home nothing to do so people wanted to watch football so they could stay at home they could buy our products and we wanted to grow our female side of the market so we decided to do the afternoon tea which if, if any of you haven't had one or haven't heard of or seen us please contact me afterwards and i'll quite happily send you one then you can taste the product, see what it's like. And uh, we wanted to mark that out to people. So my daughter, who is a lot younger than myself, uh, who was 17 at the time, said, right, we need to get onto all the social media. <clears throat> so she contacted some of the people who are in some of those pictures there you can see on the right. Um, half of them I don't know, if I'm honest. I know from programs like Love Island, uh, Made in Chelsea, I've had to become a fan of some of them and to watch them. And that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it. And we then started selling them afternoon teas. They were doing nothing. They were literally sat at home. They needed content. I think the fact that we sent them an afternoon tea gave them something to post and that works. And uh, basically the result of that is that we now got a social media uh, focus of over 60,000 people. Um, we sold over, as it happens as a figure, we sold over 100,000 afternoon teas last week. So we grew our business. So on here is uh, basically a, a video of one of the guys who came down and did a review. And it was all much, very much about the pie. So we were doing the male dominated pie side and then the afternoon version, which was predominantly uh, female based, 96% uh, female and predominantly 25 to 44. So, yeah, again, we'd shifted both of our markets. These are the elite pie level. Let's make an educated assessment of that. Pie lovers, anyway, this one's for you. If you've had a good pie in football, chance like it could well have been one of the piglet's pantry pies. Here's the box. Oh, look at the goldness. Golden goodness. We even got, because the, some of the football fans out there are not the sharpest tools in the boxes, we even got labels on top. I do 60,000 pies here a week. 
So basically that gives you an idea of how many we're doing. And obviously that's a guy who's well known in the pie world. Didn't know him before, but he did a great review on us. So, so technology. So main thing is about technology. Um, we had to rethink about everything. We had to look at our basically our products, our prices. Um, that was very much about looking at new audiences, how we can increase. So we needed the e-commerce set up. That's now become 50% of our sales and is growing. Um, from our point of view is we're now looking at how we can then bring the two back together, hence why we're now just moving to our new unit. And um, it's very much about looking at how we could do the home delivery packaging. We started off with our plain pink boxes. I think you can see in the picture with one of our influences there. We've got the, the, it's got the Enjoy, it's got the Piglets logo all over it. It's been very much about how we can um, get all of that marketing done so therefore we can constantly promote ourselves. We've also brought in um, warehouse control systems. So we've had them packaging systems, labeling um, systems, and then also we've just brought in a new QR code, which I'll, you'll be able to see at the end of this presentation and uh, link onto that. So you can actually see all of our products are now online via the QR code. So we're then all set up for Natasha's uh, law. So from our point of view, uh, sales doubled. Um, we ended up doing just over 3 million last year. So that was a great story, a success story for us. Um, come from zero to three million as a new growth in a business. So anything's possible. So if anybody's out there thinking I'm either a small company, I'm looking to start my company, we've managed to do it. So there's absolutely no reason why you can't do it. And this is the culmination of all of that. Effectively, we started off at a 900 square foot unit. We were just in a 7,000 square foot unit and we're just about to finish completing. I can't show you the pictures of the, as it is now, because there's literally people producing in there and uh, there's, there's lots of work going in there just to finish it off. So we're now at a 28,000 square foot unit. Uh, we've got enough growth there for 10 years, hopefully. Um, the way things are going at the moment, we might be there faster, but really from our point of view, technology's worked. We had a good product. We had a good loyalty already, but we built a whole new market and uh, technology certainly helps us with that. So thank you very much. Brilliant, Steve. Thank you so much. I absolutely love that. I love that. Um, I love that you're watching Love Island or were watching Love Island um, and, the, and that you now know who the influencers are. Um, but moreover, I just love the fact that how the digital technology has made your business just absolutely fly. So, um, and if I could have an afternoon tea box, I'd love one. Thank you very much. No problem at all. They get addresses <laughs> to me and I will send them out to you. So there you go. It's always in the eating. We can sit, we can sit here and waffle on for ages about how good we are. But at the end of the day, it's all about the product. And, yeah, and that's yeah. what makes it. If it's a good product, any idiot like me can sell it. <laughs> um, one very, very quick question. Um, Andrew's asked, was your business improvement planning, luck, trying out new things or a mix of everything? Yeah, uh, I'm going to go with a mix of everything. I mean, planning, I think when we sat down there and said, OK, you know, six of us got together and literally sat around a table, head in hands and said, what are we going to do? So it was the planning then. I mean, it came up with some ideas. Some of it was luck. Um, but the um, I think the. The products, as I kept saying, we'd made a really good range of products already, but I think the sort of the ideas, the planning was very much about putting them all together to come up with a package. Mm. You know, nobody at the time was doing afternoon teas. Mm. And um, from our point of view is that we looked up, um, on the internet and they were saying that over the first two or three months, I think the search engines had said that there was a, something like a 764 percent increase for the afternoon mm. teas online yeah. so we clearly recognized that we'd hit a wave now it's great having a good product and it's great having the technology but then that, from that point of view is then using all that marketing all that social media and then getting it out to everybody so mm. without going about too much i think it was a mixture of everything but yeah but no, absolutely. Good planning, so yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, as you say, quite rightly say, you need a good product, you need some good business planning, you need a little bit of luck, but you need to know how to get it out there to people as well. So that's what this whole series is about. And Andrew, I'll, just a big up for Andrew, actually. He's been yep. very good. He's mentored me through most of this for good and bad. And um, and obviously, without Joe, who came up with the ideas in the first place, we wouldn't have got anywhere. So good team effort and very much a family effort. All of our family work in this business, and that's for it's good and it's bad. Um, so they put up trees for you, but they also moan about it. So that's the the good and bad about it. But no, we've uh, you know people people are saying they're inspirational, you know, great success story. I mean, it, it is. Um, you know, 
uh, luck, hard work, mm. and planning. Brilliant. Thank you ever so much, Steve. Pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. Um, before we move on to our networking, I do appreciate we are running a little bit late, um, so I hope everybody's okay to just stay with us. Um, I just want to um, quickly say hello to um, Rob Lawrence, who's also one of our Coast to Capital Digital Champions um, that has joined. And I'm so sorry, Rob, I uh, missed you out at the beginning. So I don't know whether you just want to very quickly say hello. If you want to pop your camera on, your mic on, you can pop up and, and say hi. Rob? Going to be possible? No. Oh, yep, yeah, definitely. Joys of tech. Thank you, Rob. I'm so sorry to have missed you earlier. That's okay. I'm absolutely fine about it. I must say, those case studies were absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. uh, right, so I'm Rob Lorenz. I'm a consultant and leadership coach specializing in digital transformation, that dreadful word. Um, so um, I basically help people in three ways. I help leadership teams understand where their organization is relative to their competitors in terms of digital capability. I help them identify the digital opportunities and threats in their market. And then I help them to develop a strategy to uh, develop their capabilities in that area and then put a roadmap together to actually make it happen. Um, I'm also an author and I can't resist an opportunity to write a book um, it's called Get Fit for Digital Business, and it's really an attempt to take some of the jargon and gobbledygook out of digital transformation and, and talk about all the moving parts and how they, they work together in a way that you can actually explain to your team and they won't uh, fall asleep. So that's me, and I'm really looking forward to working with uh, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, and nice to have you along. Thank you. Um, so before we move into our networking, I hope you've all really enjoyed these case studies. I think they've been fabulous and some really brilliant, um, you know, case studies of, of how using digital technology can move your business forward and grow your business. Um, we have, as I mentioned earlier, got six uh, webinars over the next few weeks, every Tuesday and Thursday. I would, I was going to list them all off, but I know we're short of time, so I won't. But suffice to say that our next one on Tuesday all about website development and run by Digibubble um, is absolutely fab because I've already seen the slides and it is well worth attending if you have a website and you must have a website. Um, come along and hear some top tips to make sure that that website is doing everything it can for you and really bringing in the visitors. So without further ado, because I'm conscious of the clock, I'm going to pass over to Bradley, who is going to just quickly um, just run through how the networking is going to work and um, please do come and chat with all of us on our tables, Digital Champions, me, Nat, all of our speakers. And I really personally want to thank you all for coming and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks, Bradley. Thanks very much, Cheryl. I'll keep this very brief, guys, um, because I want to get you back into uh, the room. Um, let me just share my screen just for one slide that you just saw. Uh, and this is the room uh, that we will be going back into. Now, just the Remo platform works. When we go back into the room, uh, you will just need to turn your camera and microphone back on, but you will be on a table with other attendees. You'll see that you all the attendees appear as little circular icons. Uh, that's how you see different people. You can click on those icons. You can see some virtual business cards pop up. But then if you want to move around onto different tables, all you need to do is double click on a table and you will move there straight away. So there's no better way to, to, to get used to this than by trying. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I think uh, Cheryl just wrapped up there so we can come out of the presentation mode. We'll where you will land on a table, just flick your camera and microphone back on if you want to carry on networking and just start jumping around the tables if you want to uh, move onto a, another table or move to a, a different conversation. If you need any help, just drop a message in the chat box. We'll happily help um, or jump onto a help desk, which you'll see is on the left-hand side of the room. But um, unless uh, Cheryl comes back on in the next few seconds, I think that's us done. But uh, as I say, any you've, you also box on the right hand side of the room. Uh, there's some Remo tips in there to help you get the most out of it as well. So just hover your mouse over there, and you'll see some Remo tips. Is that everything, Cheryl? Yeah, absolutely. I just I literally hopped on to say no, thank you, and let's go networking. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. Great. I'll the presentation mode now.